And we're back. Thank you for lunch, although I imagine those who made it are still cleaning up. All right. <clears throat> I was asked to share a little more about uh, what we do, and, and I planned to do a little bit more of that this morning, and I skipped over some of that, so that's probably why I was done early, but I forgot. Um, as was mentioned, we, we have a little organization, family based organization in Alabama called Adaptech, um, Advancing Development with Applied Practical Technology, and that centers around our heart for helping, helping the poor in practical ways. Um, and what I intended to do this morning was introduce my family a little bit and explain the areas of the ministry that they're involved with, and that would give you an idea both of who they are and also what we do, some of what we do. So I'll go ahead and do that. My wife, like I said, is at home, and she is mama to everybody and is involved in everything and anything, and I'm sure most of you all understand what I mean by that. And Naomi, my daughter, is, she's 14 years old now, and she works with... Um, skills like sewing and crochet, a lot of crochet classes she's taught and works training usually women and girls how to do stuff like that. It works in our, our spinning stuff, technologies, trying to make rope and fiber and um, rope making and she's also involved in our food preservation and canning and all those kind of things obviously as we, we do that, food drying. And just this last fall when we were in Africa, she taught, she went with us, me and Luke and, and Naomi were there this time, and she, she had a class, how many did she have, seven? I think it was seven women and girls that she trained in crochet to be trainers of other people. So they could, and her, our intention was that they would be able to make clothes, because they have a, a lack of clothing there. Uh, it's hard to believe coming from where we where we live where every thrift store is overflowing with endless amounts of wasted clothes. But there really are a, a, a dearth of clothes there. And so she was trying to teach them a skill set that they could use to, to make clothes. What they found out is they could make uh, stuffed animals and sell them. So they started making stuffed animals for child's toys and have since created a pretty good business, small business doing that. Um, and there's Luke. Luke is my oldest. He's 19. He's uh, currently in college at the, in a diesel mechanic program at our local community college. And but you're in your second semester there, right? And he's, he is also my big dreamer. He's got uh, plans and hopes to be a pilot and study aviation and um, airplane mechanics and, and to train pilots. And also, he's looking a little bigger than, than uh, sometimes I think is maybe a little too big. But I don't want to discourage him because he might just get it done. But many places in the world we see where development has stalled in a certain area and then a new technology can come along and jump over it. So an example of that is in Salem, like in the Andes in Bolivia, they never ever had a telephone system up until just recently when they could jump over to cell phone. So the infrastructure required to run phone systems through the mountains was, was prohibitive and didn't allow that to happen until they were able to use cell phone service. So then they were able to do that. So in the same kind of way, Luke's got dreams of using air travel to overcome one of the biggest obstacles to development, which is a lack of, of roads and transportation over land. So big and lofty goals. You going to get it done? Eventually. Lord willing. So he's also my beekeeper. He trains, uh, teaches beekeeping. He's the president of the East Alabama Beekeeper Association since he was, what, 15 or something? Um, and he travels around speaking at bee clubs and 
different organizations about beekeeping too. Jacob is now, well, you're 16 now, right? Jacob um, also started college last semester and in the same program. He's taken this one off. And, but Jacob is our mechanic, doer, builder, fabricator, welder type person. He used to be the farm manager, so he kind of outgrew the position. And now he works on all of our alternative energy stuff. So he's kind of our lead guy in, in uh, wood gasification and biomass gasification technology. So when, how did I get these, these dates right? When he was 13, I think, he came home from a conference and went, went to the shop for a few days. A couple days later, we hear this, this lawnmower start running on charcoal. And uh, the next year, he came home from a conference and decided he was going to make his tr a tractor. He's going to get his old tractor from my dad's junkyard and, and make it run on charcoal and water. And he did that. And then when he was 15, he built a truck that runs on firewood and used that to transverse the United States north to south and back. And then this past year, he had spent designing his own gasifier and building another truck. Well, actually, two more trucks, right? And um, the plan was to, to embark on a big journey called Wood Gas 2020, which was to use this new technology to cross the United States from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from the Gulf of Mexico to Canada. And um, we did that first part. We did made it to the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. On the first day of the shutdown, uh, we actually got caught in Florida. They closed the beaches in between beaches. So we, we had to uh, sneak our way into the Gulf of Mexico. And we finally did that at a, at a pub. Found some water there. We could take a picture. And uh, made it home. Um, but that, that project's on hold. That's, that's to be a proving trip, put miles on. And, we don't like to send technology to the field before we really prove it because it can do a lot of damage if it doesn't work, both to the people and to the reputation and the ministry. Uh, what else do you do? Is that it? He also does most of the mechanic work when I'm unavailable out doing other public speaking or whatever kind of things we have to do. And then there's Jesse. Jesse, raise your hand. Jesse's 11, and he's really involved in our IT department. And by that mean, I mean he is our IT department. <laughs> um, he makes all of our and edits all of our training videos and that kind of stuff. He's actually anxious to get home and fire up his charcoal lawnmower that he's been building himself as a platform to work on his real project, which is developing a homemade computer board that will serve as an air fuel mixing device to make that more efficient and more user friendly. So he does things I don't understand and writes code and that kind of stuff. And so what grade are you in now? He's, yeah, a year or two ahead in school. So that's some of the things we're involved with. And, and um, like I said, all the family is very involved in the ministry uh, in a very personal way. And um, I guess that's because, well, I'm not sure why. I guess they just love the Lord and love uh, to help people and try to do good things. So <clears throat> what do we work in? Uh, that's some of the stuff, but we generally base our efforts around what we call basic human needs and we don't abide completely with the generally accepted hierarchy of needs charts and things but um, we put say for instance hope on a much higher place in our charts not that charts matter but um, we go by the acronym we fish with two H's so imagine we fish with two H's both because you know we're to be fishers of men, and also just because those are the letters that worked out real well in our acronym. But um, 
the W stands for water. We all need water. Everybody needs water for most of our body is made up of water. We have to have clean water to drink. Sometimes we have to work in uh, getting water. So how do, how do we help people to get water? So sometimes that's a matter of pumping water, building a pump out of what's available. Uh, little, we've got water pumps that are made out of little old pieces of shoe leather and, and marbles or inner tubes and PVC pipe and things like that. So we have an array of pumping equipment that we can teach um, using very simple things. Um, I guess I ought to define a little bit the term appropriate technology. Uh, most of us hear the word technology and we think of cell phones and computers. I mean, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind when you think of technology for a lot of people. And sometimes that's very appropriate and depending on the circumstances where we live. But we try to teach things that are what we consider appropriate meaning that they're available to the people who need them that they work for what they need them to work for they're affordable by the people who need them so if if some rich person in europe or the united states has to constantly buy the technology for people to use in africa or in asia or south america then it may not be the most appropriate thing to have and do. Um, it needs to be maintainable and reparable by the people who are using it. So if, if, if you as a church donate a tractor to some organization in, or some church or group of people in, in Ecuador and, or South Africa or something, but they don't know how to fix it, they don't have access to parts and tools and the training they need to repair it, then you'll have a lot of broken tractors sitting in the way in the field where they can't move them and they'll just be an eyesore and it'll be in the way unless we keep sending more resources. It's not sustainable to do things like that unless we can also have that part of it. Um, and it needs to be appropriate, it needs to be acceptable and perceived as a need by the end user. So we can think something is totally appropriate, but if the guy that you want to use this thing actually doesn't want to use it, or doesn't like to use it, or doesn't think he needs to use it, then certainly it's not appropriate. A good example of that, we have, we're involved with a group that we teach um, the use of dry leaf powder for micronutrient deficiencies. It's called Leaf for Life is the organization. And it's a procedure for using um, just generic leaves of many sorts and types to make nutrient rich food product that can be added into a diet where they don't have a lot of greenery or where they don't have, eat a lot of vegetables or where there's significant malnutrition. And, and finding ways to introduce green food into, an, into a society is difficult in some places. You know, I have a, had a student one time from Nigeria. <laughs> His attitude toward eating lettuce and salads all the time was, this isn't food, this is what food eats. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, um, so there's some difficulties there. How do you introduce that? And so um, in order to be appropriate, it has to also be acceptable on a social and just preferential level. So we found out, uh, some of our other students found out that, and from the Philippines, that in their setting, it's ideal to add, I forget the ratio, something like 30% of this to replace 30% of the flour and cookies with this powder. They found out that they could go as much as 17% and people would still accept it. But after 17%, it got too green and they wouldn't eat it. I don't know. It's just something that, that you had to figure out and make, make happen. So as I go through these, that, that's kind of what we're talking about. Appropriateness of technology. And not just technologies, but systems and, and ways of doing things and putting several things together. Um, the big hole that we try to fill is the link between the YouTube video and the end user in the developing country. 
Um, there are all kinds of ideas all over the internet. You can pull up, you can punch in wood gas into YouTube and it'll pop up, right? And, and you'll see lots of videos of a handful of people who've built a machine that will run an internal combustion engine using firewood. But to go from that idea to, okay, now how do I start doing that? How do I actually do that? How do I do it in a development setting is a, a whole different story. So we're trying to bridge that gap. I have dreams of writing textbooks aimed at that very thing to bridge the gap between the really advanced scientific journals and the very generic YouTube video type information and to make a practical, user-friendly, minimal training kind of guide, step-by-step -step to do stuff. I haven't found time or resources to do that yet, um, but I really would like to someday. All right. Um, so with that in mind, we, we try to work with developing, improving, and preparing for the field these um, technologies in these fields. So water, like I said, sometimes um, drilling wells can be done by human power or by small engines, by water power. I haven't tried water power, but I'm sure we could do it. Um, in certain places we drill, drill wells just using human power and a tripod and a, and a lifting and lowering of a, a drill rod. Sometimes it has to be more advanced and we, we've had, we were working on a deep well hard rock rig uh, with a company from Texas that invented the hammer bit. We were trying to incorporate the wood gasification to power a huge air compressor to do this for a project in Nigeria. And as we got going on it, my friend a student found another source, another group that was already doing it there. So I said, how are they into that? Um, go, go. He, he called me very worried that he was going to offend me. I, I said, no, no, it won't offend me at all. Um, whatever works. So water, water purification, we teach uh, several methods of water purification from slow sand filtration, biosand filters, uh, I'm sure everybody knows of the SOTUS method using the solar, the UV rays of the sun to purify water, um, coagulation, uh, moringa beans as a purification technique. I personally believe that uh, when, when Moses cut the hyssop branches and stuck them in the water and purified the water, I, I really think he was using moringa. Um, Maybe I'm wrong, but I just really think so. I, I have a, a class I teach sometimes on the biblical evidence of community development uh, and appropriate technology. But it's all, it's all in there. There's even, even laws on how to go to the bathroom in the Bible. You know, we, we have rules and direction on the most basic things. And then energy... The E in energy, uh, alternative engine fuel. We also we are mostly not looking at wood gasification as a means of using in, in automobiles. That's kind of the hardest way to use it. You know, you imagine making gas from wood on the road while you're going on the road as you need it. That's, that's a really high, tall order. But we have hopes of using it in... Uh, as an energy and heat source in stationary industry. So brick kilns. You know, right now, all over Africa, people make kiln cured bricks. And in order to do that, they, traditionally, they cut down huge amounts of trees to make bricks. They have to keep a fire going for two weeks, you know, in, in a big fire. It's very inefficient. And it causes a lot of deforestation. A lot of, a lot of trees get lost just making bricks. So we could make that more efficient using the technology that would help. And then food processing and canneries and food drying, coffee drying in Central America, cacao processing, all could benefit from a clean, 
gas source, you know, like it's very similar to propane. So you can imagine the difference between using a bonfire to do something or using a propane burner. You know, you, you're, you can imagine the significant difference there. And other things like powering sawmills or grinders and mills and, and power generation and electricity generation and all that kind of stuff. Very, very important for development. If you're going to mechanize and do anything beyond what a human body can do with a machete in a 10 or 12 hour day, you're going to have to have some other source of energy. And the sun gives us some with solar, but most of the places we, we work don't have untapped, big, perfectly shaped uh, rivers to power things with water wheels and stuff like that. The, the typical old American idea of go to the go to where the river is and build a mill. You know, usually those are controlled by people who are already using them for something, and not the poorest of the poor. Um, and most of our power comes from some kind of petroleum-based product and. You know, where we work in the Congo, gasoline is $27 a gallon if you can find it. And the average wage there is 10 cents a day. So how long do you have to work? <laughs> how many days do you have to work at 10 cents a day to afford a $27 gallon of gas? And then what? You know? So in places like that where, where it's just impossible to find um, petroleum. Now here, it's not as practical. I mean, we drive every day. Jacob and I both have a truck. And my, my work truck is a wood-powered truck. And I drive most places on, on wood instead of gasoline. And with gas prices, I don't know how y'all pay these gas prices. Y'all's gas is $1.10 more a gallon than ours right now, by the way. <laughs> um, I don't know what kind of taxes y'all are paying. but um, I also noticed, though, you don't have some of the sales tax we have. Um, but it might not be quite as practical here when we have such cheap energy, but, but in many places, probably many, many places where y'all work, it, it's the same. Um, I know in Mozambique, I'm sure petroleum is extremely expensive. Huh? Um, so that's some of the energy we work with. We use solar, we do solar cooking. We train in different, my wife uses a lot of solar devices for cooking. Everything from what we call a refugee camp stove to um, more elaborate parabolic type systems and can even do things like uh, big bakery size stuff. Um, we're working on a plastic to diesel program. We're trying to, to, we already know how to do it, but we want to make it convenient enough and simple enough for a, a co-op or a church to use it so they can cook plastic back into a burnable petroleum product like a, an oil, a heating oil or a diesel fuel, or at least a crude oil that they can sell somehow. Um, we think that, that if we could accomplish that, it would provide a, 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 an economic market for trash. And if anybody can make money off of trash, it'd be the poorest of the poor who can benefit from gathering the trash and then have some others who are trained in using the technology and, and make for their families a small income. Um, the reason the industry doesn't do it now is because you just simply can't compete with, with cheap crude oil in Saudi Arabia and, and Alaska and Texas and, and Pennsylvania <laughs> for, um, for oil production. So big business is never going to do that because it doesn't make the same amount of money, or at least they won't unless there's a big reason to. But we believe we don't have to make that much money to make it worth doing. So if a family in India or a group of families in India can make a little bit of money, it would go a long way in cleaning things up and providing a good income for some. So we're, we're trying to do that. We've got a shredder built and we've done some tests. We need to do some more. Um, so alternative energies, food. Um, we do a lot, we have a model garden. 
We basically incorporated that into our own family food production and gardening system. And we use a lot of Farming God's Way type stuff. They've changed the name of that organization now, but it's the same procedure. Anybody know about, heard of that? Yeah. So essentially using God's method in the woods of how he layers things, more things on top of more things, and not constantly stirring and tilling the ground and killing all, all of those, that living soil um, works out pretty well. We, we need to do better at that because we kind of get lazy sometimes and with the gardening thing and get behind on it when we're not needing it for a, for a model. Um, we teach a lot in food preservation. We do classes, we've had classes on butchering and canning and dr food drying. We're work we have a, a rocket oven that we use as the core of a food dehydration project we're working on and it's like a space heater kind of dryer that we use. Um, we're, we have the dryer part, we're working on the, the fan part to make the air move through an airspace so we can use it as a coffee dryer, a food dryer, a clothes dryer, or what have you. Um, and we're trying to do that with steam so we don't have to have electricity to power the thing. So. We have a lot of Central American students have asked, what, what can you give us for, what can you do for drying coffee? We, our coffee molds all the time. We, we need something to dry coffee fast and it's really expensive to buy fuel or firewood to, to dry it. And so we're working on that. We haven't worked on that particular project. It's been a while, um, certainly since COVID came along. I had, a, I had back surgery last, it's been a year ago this week, and then I went to Africa too soon and kind of healed sort of slow after that. And then we had COVID, and now here we are. Um, income, the eye and fish is income. We, we work with trying different technologies that can be used simply to start businesses, small business and economics. One example, we have a, a, a grain puffer. Has anybody ever seen a grain puffer? You put uh, corn or wheat or, or rice or pasta or something into a sealed container and heat it up until you get to a certain pressure. And then you rapidly decompress that. And it'll pop like popcorn, sort of. But you ever had puffed wheat and cereal? It's the same kind of thing. Uh, but it'll work with any kind of grain. So we have a homemade device like that that we use. We can use firewood or propane. And it's aimed at an idea for a business model that people can take and, and learn how to do. One thing we notice around the world in developing places, especially agricultural places, is they tend to grow just a few crops. And they tend to, because they got into a particular crop or two long time ago when great grandpa started doing it that way. And then all the, all the neighbors grow the same crops and they all grow them the same time of year. So oftentimes everybody has corn the same three, four or five weeks of the year and guess what corn's worth during those three, four or five weeks of the year, right? It's not worth much. But if we could change that a little bit Either maybe if the, through irrigation they could grow at a different time of year, or maybe they could store have store water storage so they could grow at a different time of year, or maybe there's a variety of crops that can be grown that comes off at a different time of year, or maybe there's a way to change agricultural practices so that you can have multiple crops, or maybe you can take that crop and convert it into something else, a value-added product, and so we teach uh, for. That's just a kind of a model, an example of this, but you can puff your corn and caramelize it or add some kind of flavoring to it or sell cereal or if you're the only guy on the street with caramel corn and all your neighbors are selling kernel corn, guess who gets to sell their corn, right? Um, now, again, there's a lot of, a lot of principles and, and uh, dissemination of technologies so that we don't do a lot of harm. That's a, a lot of, that's a big subject. 
uh, lots and lots of dangers involved. And I'll share a couple of those in a little while. But that's the general idea with the income. How do we, are there simple things that can be done, technologies or systems that can be introduced to dramatically change um, the circumstance so that someone can or groups of people can develop industry and hopefully complementary industries. So we have a hope in Congo, maybe they have a lot of mango trees not too far from there. We're hoping that maybe they can do some kind of drying or canning of mangoes for market and take them to the city and sell. And through that, then you have the people who work in the, in the mango factory, and then you have the people that work dealing with the composting of mango parts, and you have the seeds that get dried for engine fuel and the gasifiers, and you have all the mango farmers that can come sell their mangoes. You have this whole industry that can be developed, hopefully, if you can keep the politicians out of it. Uh, that tends to be a big problem everywhere. Shelter, we, we have many different models for shelter. Um, one, the old time cedar ram brick presses that make the mud bricks with the, I think it's 5% cement. That was, I think it was invented first in Guatemala after the 76 earthquake to be a more um, earthquake proof in a way. So it's a way to make a hard brick that's, that's uh, make it quickly and not have to fire it in a kiln. And that saves a lot of energy with that. Also, um, we do the eco shell domes that we, we learned over at Equip in North Carolina, the uh, thin shell concrete domes. We have a couple of those that we use as our bathhouses. Uh, what else do we do? Stuff. With, hmm? Yeah, rammed earth tires, which isn't ex real practical in, in developing countries. It's more practical here where we have an abundance of, of wasted tires. Um, and then we work a lot with health and sanitation stuff. Um, things like I mentioned, leaf for life, water purification, ORT, uh, oral rehydration therapy. Uh, making, essentially making Gatorade from products at home kind of thing for dehydration and diarrhea and stuff like that. Um, we, really, uh, we really like the community health evangelism approach to some of that, the CHE. I don't know if any of y'all have been exposed to CHE. It's really good stuff. Um, and well, we have a little model of a centrifuge, runs on a bicycle and what else? health oriented. I can't think of anyway. Um, one thing I didn't mention is rocket stove, our stove technology. We have a big array of fuel efficient cook stoves of different kinds. A lot of people don't know the fourth leading cause of death for women in the world is indoor air pollution from cooking fires in the house. So you can imagine you build a fire in your house and set three rocks around it and then cook over top of it. And, you know, and you're you're bent over cooking and you stir your pot and you do your thing and you're doing your laundry and doing whatever you're doing, what mamas do. And then you got the little baby on your back in a wrap, you know, and they're leaning over and breathing that smoke directly too all day long. And it causes a lot of problems. It's a huge killer of women and it destroys their immune system and it makes for a really bad uh, infant mortality rates and, and mothers die prematurely. And so a friend of ours, a mentor of mine, invented something called a rocket stove. You, if you Google it, it'll pop up everywhere. And a lot of ones that aren't really good will pop up too, so be careful. Um, he's from Oregon. He's a Catholic fella. And he dedicated his life to helping the poor long time ago. And so he invented this stove and, and we've learned all about it and the different applications of it. And he comes out once a year for a couple weeks and helps us with projects and we throw ideas around and work together. So we have an array of those around which we build a lot of, of our tech. 
And so that's kind of the stuff that we're involved in. Um, I like talking about the why more than the stuff because the stuff's just stuff, but um, except for the wood gas truck, that's just really, really cool. And uh, it never gets old. And also the grain puffer. It never gets old blowing stuff up. And <laughs> you can do that a hundred times a day and you just want to do it again. You know, it's just <laughs> boom! It sounds like a giant cannon and it rattles the windows down the road. And, yeah. Um, there's so many, uh, so many principles in everything I just said that can be talked about as for the dissemination of technology and the, the proper sharing of it. And even just the practicality of it, that, that grain puffer. I had a class there last year, the year before, not too long ago, and, and I had people from, I don't know, nine or 11 different countries there, and, and we blew that thing off. and and. One, one, of our, one of the Africans there, he took off running. He, he, I think he had been in the war in, in uh, I don't know if it's Sierra Leone or Nigeria or somewhere. I can't remember. Huh? Nigeria. And, and, and then we had a, a worker there, a guy from Guatemala. And he, he jumped up and said, yes, this is exactly what we need. This would be perfect. We take this to the middle of town, we blow this thing off, people will come from everywhere and buy our corn. <laughs> and the African guy, he said, this would never work. If you did this where I live, the soldiers would come, people would run away and hide in a bush for two weeks, thinking the war had started again. And so, not everything's appropriate for everywhere, right? So, um, it has to be culturally applicable where it is where it's not appropriate. Um, so I was asked to share about some successes and failures that I've seen and know of. And I, I was just thinking about do, doing harm by introducing technology. There's an old story about the rocket stove, actually. It happened in Liberia, I think. And some people learned the technology very well and they were really excited and they, they rushed off to the mission field and they found a place they could do a project and people were very receptive to it. And they, the people went there, got the project going and did it, trained some trainers. The trainers went around training everybody else. Some people started businesses making these things and it was really successful on the surface. It looked really good. And thousands, a whole region of people ended up having these fuel-efficient cook stoves in their house. They're no longer breathing these large clouds of smoke. And health started rising, infant mortality went down. It was a big, good thing. Even just in the short several months, six months. Until, and, and, and this group, they went there and they did the work and they went home. You know, they, they kind of left it there. And everybody felt like it's a good thing. And the next year, come planting time, they got up in the rafters of their house and they took down all their bags of seed corn and seed for their gardens and opened it up and it was full of insects, weevils, and, and destroyed all their corn. Because, why? Because the smoke is no longer keeping the insects out of the, the grain up in the rafters where they have always stored it. So everybody was totally innocent I mean, nobody was, nobody had malintent. Everybody had good intentions. Everybody thought it was a great thing on every side. But if it hadn't been for a great deal of relief being poured into that situation and new seed being brought in by the, if that organization hadn't been able to replace that seed, um, a lot of people would have starved to death, probably, or been very, very hindered by that that reality, that they had destroyed all their seed, totally not knowing the effect. So a lot of times there's effects of, and I'd say this goes beyond technology, this goes, you know, we turn the world upside down all the time, whether we know it or not. And so there's a lot to be, what I'm getting at is there's a lot of responsibility. And especially for those of you translating the Bible, I'm sure you, you feel that weight too. I hope so. That you have a big responsibility that what we, what we take has an effect, good or bad. 
and what we do there. So I'm always a little bit hesitant to, to just encourage people, rush out here, come learn technology, and take it, take it, take it. Um, there's very definitely a time to do it and do it right. And um, there's a lot of damage has been done with good intentions. So it's, it's not as simple as just let's learn it and go and take it and do it. Um, so that's one principle. Um, when I was in Bolivia years ago, I saw there's this one community. This organization had come in. It's an American-Canadian organization. Had come and done a big project there. And as often is the case, people will first develop a project and then start looking for a place to implement it. And I don't know that it's all wrong, but um, a lot of times, if we start with the solution rather than the problem, then we're, <laughs> we're going to be guided toward uh, holding on to our solution rather than, than somebody else's. So there's this funny story about this group that got a, a grant, had a bunch of money, went to Bolivia and the Altiplano down just north of Oruro on the high plains, and they did a, a very big uh, improved latrine program. So a huge problem around the world. Uh, most people, we don't really understand. There's more than a billion people on the planet have no toilet. A billion people, more than a billion people in the world who have no place to go to the bathroom. You know, you have public defecation and, and things like that all over the place. That's a big problem when you start talking about transmission of disease and things like that and flies and and the food supply and so that's it's not very exciting field of study and work but it's it's a really important one and so this organization was trying to combat that and all these homes all these families all these farmers across the plains up in the high andes they they had no sanitary latrines they went there they worked with them they developed a program they built, I think it was something like 1,800 um, improved latrines with concrete floors and fly trap systems and really nice brick buildings with metal roofs and it was really nice and they were really good and I would, I would encourage anybody to have one. They were really, really good models. And they went back a year later to do a, an update, follow up on the project, see if they're being used and how, how is it going and because that's a big part of, of technology dissemination. How does it hold out? How does, the, how does it go on? So a follow-up. And they went back there and they did a study and almost every one of those buildings was full of bags of grain. They were packed to the top, all full of grain. And they went, why are you using this building like this. He said, well, that's the best building I have. And nothing keeps my grain better than that nice concrete floor and that good metal roof. And why would I go do what you want me to do in there when I need a place to store my grain? So the organization felt like they had failed when I say they, they had succeeded at providing really good grain storage for uh, 1,800 families. And so I think that proves the need for discerning the perceived needs of the community before we go tell them what they need to do. Um, a lot of times we have, I mean, I know it's cliche to say it, but it's true. We, we have this idea we've got the answers or else we wouldn't be going there and doing anything, right? We, if we didn't think we knew something we wouldn't t and had something to share, we wouldn't be trying to share it. And th there might be some validity to that, but oftentimes, in my experience, I've made a fool out of myself numerous times thinking I, I knew, knew better than they did. And, and one of the more recent times was just this past fall. Luke and I kind of made fools of ourselves. <laughs> Um, Luke was with me and he was doing investigatory trips and treks into the jungle or the woods and, and trying to figure out the bee situation where we were, work, where we were working there. 
to see if it's viable to start a bee project and what kind of bees they have to work with and things. And, and they fig figured out there's three different kinds of bees there. And, and there's one called a little, it's a very rare, little tiny itty bitty honeybee called a stingless honeybee, one of the stingless types. It's kind of like a, it looks like a fly, yeah. It's technically not a bee, it's a fly. Okay, technically not a bee, it's a fly. But it makes honey, so. Um, so the, the people we were working with, the organization, the group there, they were really excited. Oh, we know where there's bees, come, come, we'll go. And so they, they went there and they climbed up in this tree and they hacked on it until they got a hole cut in there and they started pulling out bee stuff and honey and comb and propolis and stuff. Anybody who's a beekeeper might know what propolis is. It's a waxy kind of glue, antibiotic glue that the bees use to seal their hives and to use as medicine and stuff. And at home, whenever we're working bees, we'll just throw some of it in our mouth and chew it like gum. It's kind of like chewing gum. And it's just a, it's a healthy thing to do. It's good for your teeth. It makes hydrogen peroxide when you chew it and cleans your teeth. It's, it's really healthy for your gums and it's got antibiotics in it. And, so we normally do that. So they were passed the plate down and they, it's kind of getting dark at night and they didn't notice. We're sitting here, we're chewing on this stuff and we're, we're just going at it. And we've been in Africa for a whole month now with, with nothing but warm Coca-Cola for sweets. So we were, you know, we were anxious to get some of that honey. Up. And we're chewing on this propolis and all of a sudden they realize we're, we're chewing on it. And they said, no, 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 don't, don't chew on that. We said, we do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Um, we do this all the time. <laughs> and uh, they said, no, no. And so they were finally insistent enough. And Luke said, well, you, you always do teach that one of the principles of development is to listen to the locals to, and when, you know, to gather information. Because they're the experts on where they live more than you are. And so, uh, yeah, okay. So we stopped chewing on it. And, and it wasn't very long after that, the psycho psychedelic effects of this stuff started taking effect. <laughs> and apparently there's some kind of material they gather from some plants and put into their propolis, which on a human brain has an effect. So Luke quickly returned to camp, did his chores, and quickly went to bed before anybody could find a camera to record anything he might say. And I sat on the porch and had a nice quiet evening watching everything go by. But um, <laughs> trying. <laughs> so getting stoned for Jesus, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so always listen to the locals. <laughs> yeah. and don't break your own rules. All right. But we were sure there was nothing wrong with it. We, we've done it all our lives, and no, not this. All right, so perceived needs. Um, I talked about that with the, the latrines. If, if that organization had gone there and, and done a really good job at figuring out what the perceived needs were, they might have found out we really need buildings to store our grain in. They might have realized that to start with. And, and as it was, they ended up disappointed and discouraged with the whole thing because what they built wasn't used the way they intended it to be. And so I, I have a, the, the people I grew up with in that organization, they had been missionaries in the jungles of Bolivia about back about the time I was born. And they, their experiences from that is what caused them to come home and, and start the organization where I grew up. And there, I served in that same place too later on when it was more developed. And after that, organ, that group there had started sending people to a deeper place in the jungle. And it was quite successful as a development project. And the place is called Sepecho in Bolivia. I don't know if anybody's been to Bolivia knows down towards the Alta Bini River. But when they first got there, they, they came in as preachers and and they, they, wanted to do, well, they wanted to do a protein project. They really noticed the people were suffering from a lack of protein, that, that people had come as homesteaders from all over the country 
the highlands, the lowlands, the everywhere else, the coastal, well, they don't have coastal, but the lake coast, they call them coastal region. And they all went down to this new place in the jungle the government opened up. It's kind of like Oklahoma back in the 1800s when they would give you so much land if you'd go out there and live on it and make it productive. And so they, all these people, all these different tribes and languages coming together in this one place, and they were trying to pull them together to get something done as a project. And so they had a meeting, and they called everybody together and said, okay, I want to I help you all with your needs and what you think you need to do. Um, so I'd like everybody to go think about it and pray about it and come back in, in two weeks, and we'll have a vote on what we need to do as an organization or as a community to help the community. You know, what can, what can we do? And they went, and they studied on it for a couple of weeks, and they came back, and they all said... We think the most important thing we could do as a community, I mean, they're starving to death. There's a child mortality rate of 7 out of 10 before the age of 2. Diarrhea is rampant because they don't have clean water. They're living in bamboo, thatched roof huts in the torrential rain in the jungle. They don't know how to live there. They come from the highlands where they farm sheep and llamas and wearing wool clothes in the tropics and they don't know how to farm in this environment. They're suffering in all kinds of ways. There's no roads to speak of, no transportation. They just walked out there, and one of my great mentors actually led that group of people out there and used fireflies between his fingers as a flashlight to get, get out there in the first place. And he, uh, they got together and said, what we really need is a soccer field. <laughs> that was what they needed, right? That, that was what they considered to be their great need. And, and my friend, who was totally discouraged, said, this is, this is a nightmare. This is terrible. They're, they don't need a soccer field more than I need a hole in the head. It, it, it's a complete waste of time and energy to do this. But he had made the commitment, whatever it is you want to do, we'll do. So he kept to his word, and they joined together and formed committees and assigned people to different groups and different parts of the project and cleared land and dug up stumps and gathered sod and planted grass and watered it and did all the things they needed to do. They made soccer teams and they made a schedule for their soccer, what do you call it, league, so that everybody could come and play. And it turned out, after a year of that, that it turned out to be the very best possible thing that could have happened because it, it created a venue for all these different people from different places around the country to come together around something common. And I'm not a big sports guy. I don't, down home, sports is a, a fake religion, <laughs> an idolatry in Alabama, but uh, especially football. But they, we're given an, a venue to come around together and get to know each other. And came, like we were talking about earlier, how do you get to know your neighbors? Well, there it was building a soccer field together and having soccer games once a week. That, that's what did it for them. And after that, they were able to do many, many other projects until today. It's a very developed, one of the most developed places in the Amazon of Bolivia because they were able to function that way and now they send people off help other communities. So let's not, let's not forget the need for paying attention to perceived needs. People usually know better than we do what they, what they need. Um, when I was in Venezuela, I was sent down there to start or to help build a, a campus for the training center. We we're going to do uh, community development trainings with people all over, and this was back before the FARC took over and the communists uh, from Colombia kind of took over and, and Venezuela became what it is, uh, unfortunately now. Um, I have a lot of friends there. I wonder if they're even still alive with the things going on now. But there was a tribe. Everybody seen the end of the spear, I'm sure, the movie or read the book or something? There was a tribe called the Colorados that were very similar to that. Um, and one of their 
people, um, the son of a chief <clears throat> who was destined to be the next witch doctor for the tribe, had run away because he didn't want to be a witch doctor. He, he left and he had gone out and worked for some other people. And through that, he ended up coming to our training, our school, and learned some things. And he ended up becoming a Christian. And he wanted to go back to his people, and he wanted us to go back to his people. So um, we were pretty timid about that start, but some went. And they went there, and, and they, they met the, the chief witch doctor, the dad, who never did, as far as we know, um, come to know the Lord or anything. But he, in his, his custom, he, he ordered <laughs> that the biggest boar in the camp be castrated for supper. And, um, and that's what everybody got served. So you might get fed something you don't want to eat. But eating what's placed before you in that situation had a big effect because through that situation they were able to do and this is an example of how the practical or the, the spiritual follows the practical uh, we were able to do some fish projects there and they wanted to learn how, how do you they'd learn they'd heard that we knew how to grow fish away from the river so they wanted to be able to not have to go to the river there's other tribes at the river and they always have to fight and they don't, they're always scared of getting in, in, into other people's territory. So we want to grow fish away from the river. Can you help us? Yeah, we can, we can do tilapia away from the river. So we helped them talk to them about how to, they didn't really want us there. They didn't want to be overrun with outsiders coming in, but we gave them the information. They would, we, some would go and, and talk to them and, they would do it, and then we come back, and oh, you got to do this. And so they, they ended up digging some fish ponds and got some tilapia going and learned how to make, grow fish away from the river, as they said it. And later on, um, many of them, the, after the father had died and the son had become chief, then many of them, basically all of them, had become Christians and started following the Bible as a result. I haven't heard what's happened to them since. Um, everything, everybody had to leave Venezuela when the, this current dictator came along. And so I, I don't know what has happened there. I'd like to know. Um, when I was in Bolivia another time, we had, I'd gone into a, a new, I was doing an internship there with this organization called Cenetec, which is Centro Nacional de Tecnología Apropiada por Desarrollo. Oh, I can't remember the whole name, but it's a very long name as usual. Uh, basically, the National Center for Appropriate Technology for the Development of Poor People, I think is the way it translates. Anyway, we were, we were down there and way, way out in, on the high Andes, over 16,000 feet above sea level very hard to breathe there. People that had run up there when the Spaniards came a long time ago and had never come down and essentially wore the same clothes, spoke the same language, sang the same songs, believed the same stuff as they did when they went up there. And we, we had gone, been working there for quite a while. We'd built a road going in there. Uh, and when I say we, I mean they, and I was the one outsider white guy that was there I was the fourth or fifth white person they had ever seen ever and the first one they ever seen was just I think six years before that um, and a couple of my friends that went before me and you want to talk about a hard language to, to learn try catch well one time that's tough um, we're doing replanting of eucalyptus trees we're doing Oh, many different projects like that. Uh, greenhouses eventually. We had a ham radio and CB system set up through about 80 different villages through the mountains. And we were going to take a medical team down from Auburn, nurses and doctors and dentists and things. We went in there. 
I we took the team in, and that was the first time anything like that ever happened there. And people came from miles and miles and miles and miles around to go see a doctor for the first time in their lives. And we got a call on a radio from a village at the edge of our, of our network. There's a, a woman in labor that's been in labor for two weeks. She's been trying to have a baby for two weeks. And she was in really bad shape and had a high fever and infection and was in terrible shape and was way out there. And they'll be here tomorrow about so it's in such time. So I, I was told, take the Jeep as far as you can and then try to meet them where you can and show them in. So I went out there and I helped carry this woman in and it was you know, on these little narrow ledges and I actually get in trouble because I kicked a dog off the cliff because he was trying to trip us. But um, I have a friend that always tells that story and she, she doesn't want to paint me in a bad light. So he wasn't trying to, he was just trying to be nice. I, Sarah, I was not trying to be nice. I was trying to kill the dog. Just get over it. <laughs> I was perfectly okay with that dog not being alive anymore. Um, and so we got this woman back and the nurses, because of the culture, the, the pediatrician, gynecologist, doctor that was there is a man and he wasn't allowed to be in with her. But through the nurses, he was able to treat her and saved her life. They got the baby who was already dead, but um, they saved the, saved the mama. And through all that interaction, um, that couple, that the man, became converted. He, he wanted to know, you know, this doesn't make sense. Why would you travel all the way down here just to help us like this? This doesn't, you know. And so they, we were able to share with him the gospel and had to go through three different languages, I think, and, um, and finally he, he got it. And then they found somebody in his village that knew how to read a little bit, and they found part of an old Catholic Bible and they, when they went home, then nobody ever heard of them anymore. And they went home, and they knew enough to read the Bible. And they started reading the Bible and following what they could understand of the Bible. And the man I worked with, worked for in this organization, he also did a lot of water projects, piping potable water into villages. And he had grants. I think he got grants from Sweden, I think, some secular groups in Sweden, humanitarian groups. And so he is really frugal with his money, so he would, he would bid a job and then he'd have extra money and he'd get enough materials to go do another job. And so he, that was one of these situations. So that group, that, that town, that village, that always worshiped these three rocks, up these big boulders on the side of a hill. And they, they had went back to the village, this couple did, and he was, I don't think he was a chief, but he was up in, up, in, up in the leadership somehow. And they began reading the Bible. And they, they read the part where it hadn't rained and they tore down the idols and God sent rain. I, I can't remember where that was exactly. And they were having a drought and their, their crops were dying. So they, they were praying, what do we do? And they were reading the Bible and they came across that. And they said, well... These people tore down their idols, their stone idols, and God sent rain. So they went up to, they talked to the people, and they convinced them that this is the way we need to go. And they went up there and spent two or three days beating those idols down into gravel and threw them off the mountain and cast down their idols. And as out of desperation, they, they, they're going to die. They don't have the food. They, their crops are failing. And within, I think it was two days later, Ben Ho, my friend, came there and said, I've got enough materials to make a water project. Do all, would you all want to do the labor if I provide the materials to, to bring in piped water? And so they took that as a sign that God had delivered, delivered rain when they, when they needed to because they tore down their idols. Um, so I guess you can look at some of these and say, well, that's just the result of God working in people lies, people doing good things. Uh, I guess I'm getting a little late here. I? But I guess that's all it really is about anyway. Um, people doing good things for, good, for people that need help in the right ways. 
There's one more little story I'd really like to tell. We have time. What, what time are we supposed to quit? Okay. So we'll just, we'll just take a look, you know, go ahead and finish your story. All right. We'll take a five-minute break and you can jump right in. All right, there's a, a story. I wasn't personally involved in this one, but I think it really tells the story about ownership of the projects. Um, my, a friend of mine was involved in this. He's a Baptist. I think he's from up, up north somewhere in Delaware, maybe. Um, I don't know where he started off. But... He was involved with a, a group. They went to Haiti, and they, they got involved with a church group there. And the church group asked them, can you help us raise money to put a tin roof on our church building? They had a mud building, and they wanted to put a roof on it. And, and they said, oh, yeah, we can do that. So they went home, they raised money, got it real excited, and they raised them a lot more money than they needed for that. So they decided, well, we'll not, we'll not just put a roof on We'll just go down there and buy that plot of land next to them. And we'll build them a church building, like a real one, like they need to have. If we're going to do it, let's do it right, you know. So they went down there. They built a nice, big, modern building. They showed them how to do it. They, they put a bunch of money into this place, and a nice, big building, something like this, maybe. And instead of helping them put their roof on their church, they built them a new church. So then they left, went back home, feeling very happy about themselves for having helped the poor Haitians, I suppose. And a, a few years later, they got a call, the roof on your church is leaking, you should come fix it. Um, they, the people there had never used the church. They never went in it, never used it, never had a service there, never did anything with it. They were still meeting under a plastic tarp on their little mud hut because they didn't want that church. That church sent a different message to the people they were trying to reach and they didn't want to be seen as being that rich American people that, that uh, were just giving them handouts and things. So they were trying to, so they, they were staying true to who they were, but the American missionaries had gone there and built for them a big fancy church that they didn't even need. So a lot of principles there, and um, I guess there's a whole lot more that could be talked about. But anyway, hopefully that's what what you were looking for, and I appreciate y'all's attention. Thank you.